Hello everybody, good evening and I hope you're keeping well. You're very welcome to our webinar this evening for business studies teachers. Um, my name's Connor Walker, I'm the head of Post Primary Publishing at Folands here and very soon I'll hand you over to Chloe Keane who will be presenting on the recent 2022 exam paper and giving her thoughts on that. Um, but first things first, I wanted to thank everybody for joining me and Chloe this evening. It's a very busy time for teachers. I know you've got lots going on, so we're very grateful um, for you joining us. And some of you might recognise me from some of the conferences that I've been at in recent years. So it's, if, if you do, it's great to see you and thanks for joining us again. I'm sure you'll get a lot from the 45 minutes or so that, that you'll spend at this webinar. Um, so really what I was going to do first, if it's okay with you, maybe take five minutes to do uh, a shameless plug of our excellent new Smart Business uh, Second Edition teaching package. And just for about five minutes or so, I was going to run through what's in the program and also um, just go through some of the, the new features that we've introduced into the book. Um, and I figured it'd be it would make sense to do that because that would you know showcase things to people who are using the first edition but also it would um maybe sort of be something that people who are maybe not as familiar with the book um would would see as maybe valuable or something that they might be interested in so without further ado um this is the teaching package that we produce so like a lot of um business studies programs there's a print and digital component so we have a textbook a skills and accounts book which used to be called the student's learning log and um, there's also a teacher's guide that we have for all your planning requirements. The digital resources we have I include things like a student ebook. We've got a full range of PowerPoints for all the, the chapters of the book. We have a full range of bookkeeping videos which help to step through the more complex or tricky elements of bookkeeping for students. We've got um, editable terminally exams that we make available across the three years of junior cycle. And we also have um, a full set of web links to third party websites should you want to go to other resources and um, use them to enhance your classroom experience. So if we look at what's new in the program, I'll just very quickly go through that. So to begin with, um, what we've done with Smart Business is we've taken on board all the feedback on the first edition. We've streamlined its structure. So we've now just got three simple strands with 40 chapters across the board, including um, an exam preparation chapter that we'll look at shortly and also a glossary. So if keywords, if vocabulary building is important for you as a resource, um, that might be a, a useful thing to have at the back of the book. We've got a brand new layout, so it's brand new colourful design, as I hope you can see here from some of those screenshots. And we've also put an emphasis on keeping things concise because one of the pieces of feedback that we consistently get is just how long the business studies course is and how difficult it is to cover um, it with your textbook. So we've we've been very mindful of keeping it as concise um, but also covering all the key content appropriately and just giving the book a more accessible look um, making it more suitable for the common level. Um, a big change that we've made is just its structure that we've made sure that it's anchored all around um, learning goals. So the chapters are chunked by learning goal and this essentially lays the foundation for the structure of the textbook and the skills book as well. So you can see highlighted there, that's an example of, of how they might be stated at the beginning of a chapter. There's, I suppose they're like your learning intentions for the chapter and this little animation shows how everything links up. So at the beginning of the chapter, you've got your, your learning goals. In this case, it's the three learning goals, 1.1 through to 1.3 for chapter one. And then within the chapter itself, there are separate sections of the book which follow that learning goal structure. So this is section 1.1. And then correspondingly, we've got um, a 1.1 section in the revision section at the back of the book and also in the, the skills and accounts book that follows the learning goal structure as well, which we link to. And it keeps everything just very easy to navigate, very accessible. And, you know, that's something both I think will benefit teachers using it and also your students. We've got lots of new content. So these are some examples of, of some case studies that we've added. So there's one on the housing crisis and, and energy crisis, and there's questions that follow those if you want to dive into them a little bit more with your students in class. We've got brand new chapter summaries, and um, so that helps to revise key terms and, and formula if they apply to the chapter. 
Um, we've also got a revision section at the end of every chapter. So here's an example of one. So questions are grouped by learning goal and they're perfect for revision and exam preparation. I mentioned earlier that we've got an updated skills and accounts book. So this again was what we called our learning log in the first edition, but this has been completely revamped. It includes now an even broader range of exam style questions, more accounting questions and budget questions. There's um, also a section at the end of each chapter to support student self-assessment to reflect on their learning and also if they have any um, ideas for the CBAs, they can log them there. So there's the CBA support there and also in the textbook. We've also got a brand new teacher's guide, which includes schemes of work and chapter lesson plans, which map to both the 40 minute and the one hour classes, depending on, on how your school timetables. And if I might segue now into Chloe's part of the present presentation, I just wanted to quickly mention the, the new brand new exam focus that we've brought into the book, particularly taking advantage of the fact that we've got um, yet another exam. So there's the one in 2022, which we've been able to um, help tailor all the content of, of the book to match to. So it's exam line content. We use the action or the command verbs from the specification in, in the questions that we ask. Um, there's a range of exam style questions. We take past paper excerpts like you can see here. And all that pulled together brings a, a brand new exam focus to the book and hopefully will put students in a position to be exam ready when they get to the end of third year. There's also just finally a new exam chapter which I wanted to run you through. So this initially explains the exam format and question answering strategies like as you can see here the book technique and the C technique for students. Um, and then we go through the different question types that they're likely to encounter in the examination itself and we include model answers with that. And then there's also then at the end of that chapter a section which um, it's basically an exam question bank or um, a bank of questions with exam style questions and we include the various links to the relevant chapters to show I suppose how things um, blend together in the question um, as it's asked so that you're covering multiple um, learning outcomes in the same way that you do in the exam itself. So finally, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the new edition of Smart Business, feel free to go on to Follins.ie, take a look at the uh, flip books that we have of the textbook and the skills and accounts book and the teacher's guide and all the digital resources that we have. And also, um, if you want to get in touch with our, our Follins rep, they're available for calls and appointments at a time that suits yourself. We can arrange samples for you. We can support book rentals. So go on to followings.ie, plug in your school name or your role number, and then you'll find out which author, or sorry, author, some which uh, rep to contact and um, also, um, you know, their contact details. So you'll have their, their phone and you can give them a call and talk to them a little bit more about that. So that's really it. Um, I'm going to introduce you now and I'm delighted to introduce you to Chloe Keane. She teaches at Castle Troy College and is the chair of the BSTAI Limerick branch. So I'm sure many of you will, will know her. And she's also the NCCA rep for junior cycle business. Uh, she's also studying maths as well as to put another string to her bow. So, um, you know, she's very active um, as a teacher and um, a lifelong learner, obviously. Um, I first met Chloe at the, the last BSTAI conference and she and Katie Jones gave a really, really good presentation, I think, on the exam paper. So I thought it would be great to invite her not only to be involved in, in reviewing and working on the Smart Business Project, but also to come here this evening to talk again about the exam because I thought it was very insightful. So um, uh, just one other housekeeping thing. If you want to post a question to either myself or Chloe, please do so via the Q&A option at the top of your screen or there's also a chat option. So if you want to click the chat button, enter your question, we'll come through to as many uh, of those as we can um, at the end of the presentation. So with that, Chloe, um, I'll hand it over to you if you'd like to take control of the screen and best of luck. Thanks a million. Uh, so it should be sharing there if there's no technical difficulties. Um, so hopefully you can all see um, my presentation there. So I suppose I'm just going to focus on what can we can take from last year's exam and forward into this exam. 
Um, I'm not associated with the SEC at all. It's just kind of what I've taken from looking at the marketing scheme and uh, going to different events throughout this year and speaking to colleagues in my own department. So just firstly, uh, what I'm going to go through this evening is the 2022 paper and what we can take from it. And then the the action and the command verbs and what way I kind of deal with them when it comes to my own classes. Um, the common errors and the breakdown of the marks that I've seen from this year and what I can see with my own classes. I have two junior star classes this year, two third years. Um, looking at some exam style answers and then just, I suppose, a few tips that I've used in my own practice um, this year. So I suppose the first thing to look at is the the actual chief examiner's report, because a lot of what I've seen from the paper and the marking scheme this year, are the same kind of things that were highlighted in the, the first chief examiner's report in 2019 on the new paper. So they were just highlighting the fact that there is no choice. And I suppose a common level that's very hard. Um, and the focus on tonight is, I suppose, how to prepare them as best as you can for the different style of questions that come up. They were talking about effective time management and um, I suppose the focus that I'm going to concentrate on is the, the errors that they were speaking about. So if they have a chance to look back on the errors that they've made, but also I suppose the workings is what I'll, I'll be looking at as well and how a lot of kids fall down on things like that. Um, the focus on the bookkeeping elements, and I suppose last year's exam was a bit of a surprise for, for some in the way that they laid out the bookkeeping question. Um, other things that were talked about is just the linking of the strands, which I think was evident in this year's exam paper and the way that they, they blend the longer questions and the examples that can be used from local businesses and the impact and the impact questions seem to be what the students find the hardest. Um, and then they spoke about using the bug technique and I suppose the importance of the outcome and the command verbs. So I wanted to look at those as well. So the first thing I'm going to look at is just from the 2022 uh, paper, what we can look at and the kind of things that I've taken from looking at the marking scheme. So the first thing in some of the short questions, they were very specific in the language that they used. And then they kind of wanted that reiterated in the questions. So question one in the short questions is an example of a few others listed there. So it was speaking about a graph and graph was something that were highlighted in the chief examiner's report. And actually, one of the JCT days, they spoke about the fact that one of the students' biggest weakness is not only um, drawing graphs, which they can make silly errors in, but also interpreting graphs. Now, I suppose the first one was an easy enough graph to interpret, but it was the language that was used. So the question was um, about household expenditure. So what was the highest percentage of household expenditure? And that seemed to have been answered fine. But when they were giving an example of each, they some students were mixing up and um, giving types of business expenditure, as opposed to households. So just getting them used to underlining the key information that's given in the question there. If it says household expenditure, well, then they're expecting an example of household expenditure. Um, in the question eight, um, it was an identify. And something that I noticed about the identify questions was they're still expecting full sentences and a, and a bit of an explain answer there. So it was identified two benefits of shopping locally for the local economy. So I give this question to my own students and a lot of them weren't specific enough about local, even though locally and local was mentioned three times in the question alone. So I suppose just to get them used to it, they're, they're at a young age, but the, the pitch of the paper is very high for a common level. So it's getting them used to being specific in their answers and referring back to the question itself. Another question that came up was discuss two roles of a social enterprise that it plays in society. So I suppose they wanted the specifics of the society and we could see that in the American scheme. And then again, identify two benefits of the membership of the EU and it was specifically for Ireland. So they needed to refer to Irish businesses, the Irish economy. Um, and again, identify was used there with benefits. So it was really more of an explain answer, even though the outcome verb was identify. Um, another one that they gave and was kind of poorly answered by some was um, what is the social benefit to Irish people of an increase in carbon tax? And they needed to be specific to the society there and Irish and again, Irish businesses. So they need to be very specific in referring back to the question, which is something that I'm trying to focus on now at this time of the year with my classes. The accounting topics then that come up. So the first short questions, they were both on... Um, double entry, the, the analyzed cash book, bookkeeping there. And the biggest errors I suppose that was made there was um, that figure of the 390 for the balance CD and balance BD. 
the the mark there was for the date, but also they accepted balance on its own this year. But they were, I suppose, in different events that I've gone to, people were saying, well, they might be as lenient moving forward, that they need to be specific in knowing what a balance CD and a balance BD is. And the fact that they use the same figure for both. And, and that's what a lot of them were losing out in the marks on. They were taking maybe the total figure and putting it down here. And then with the double entry bookkeeping, again, I was talking to different people and colleagues about it. And I'd have a habit of getting the kids to write the year up the top and then the day and the month. But they need all three. Now, it seems to be OK if they put the, the year under the date and then the day and the month. But they have to have all three somewhere in their answer. And um, I suppose just focusing on the double entry there, a lot of the errors that was made was they were putting them both in on the debit side or both in on the credit side and they're losing out marks there because they needed to show the double entry rule there for every credit. There's a corresponding debit and so on. The final accounts was kind of one that threw a lot of people. And I suppose whether or not the template was being given, we weren't really sure of based on previous exam papers that we had seen. So I'm kind of focused on making mine this year um, learn the template. And it's hard for them. It's it's rote learning. I mean, it's it's two accounts where they have to have the word incorrect. And there was marks given for certain headings and there'll be different headings that marks will be given for in other years. So I just something that I've tried with my own classes is, is there any bits of the account that I can take out and make simpler for them to learn it off? So I've taken the first kind of top part there. They didn't have to have cash sales, but sales would be enough. So I've taken the first top part of the account and I put sloppy beside it so they could learn off the sales, less cost sales, opening stock. And um, trying to put abbreviations or acronyms in there to help them learn. We've done last man standing. So I've kind of gone around the room and one person, will, I'll say sales and the next person is to name out the next part of the account and everyone is to go around. That's just one way. And I, I give them a night off homework if everyone in the class um, got it right. Now, for some kids, that's hard, you know, being able to, to say out loud and get something wrong in front of all the class. But it's something I was trying to promote with them this year, that they're comfortable in giving answers. And I suppose having them since first year, I've been pushing that all along. But I know some kids just doesn't suit. So the focus on the template, I think, is definitely needed going forward because we know now that we were given half the the income statement and we mightn't even be as lucky as that um, in future years. The workings, I suppose, are important. One thing that was flagged um, was that they got the mark for the depreciation workings. If there, There's usually a little box given down the end of um, the trial balance for the depreciation working. So even if they had forgotten to put it into the account as an expense, they would still get the mark for the, some of the marks for the figure for working it out. So I'm really pushing with mine, show your workings all the time. You know, you might get marks for them, even if it's a calculation question. And there seems to always be in these papers now that there's a separate box for the answer and the amount of kids that will just forget to put it in there. So if they shown all the workings, I've pushed with them that if something's worth three marks, well, then they're, they're not necessarily going to give you three marks for just the final answer. You need to show your workings as well, because there's three steps to that figure and that's where the marks will be going. Uh, so that's just the box that I was talking about there. Um, it says if required, but I, I've been pushing my students to do it because, I mean, it was two marks for the depreciation workings there. So, so why not put your workings there? And if they do forget, then they're trying to remember the whole template. Well, at least they might pick up the two marks there. So just looking at what they might not be as lenient on moving forward in the final accounts, they seem to have been open enough with the headings. So things like current liabilities falling due within one year and more than a year, they, they were kind of accepting um, current liabilities on its own there, but that mightn't be the case moving forward. And the need to label authorise and issue share capital, there wasn't marks going for individually labelling them, but in the future it could be a heading. So these are just kind of ones that I flagged with my own classes. And again, the adding of the opening reserves, they were a bit lenient in the way that it was done in this year's exam paper and the different names that you could call it. But I suppose just to be specific, to make sure and to do that after their net profit and then to have their reserves figure going into the statement of financial position. OK, so I'm just going to look now at some of the, the outcome or the, the action verbs that have come up in the papers and what I've kind of said to my students to, to do when they see them. So explain, I've always said to them, most of the time it's a key term or a definition, but you need to give two pieces of information. So I've said to them, always use the state explain example method. 
Now, this is the method I suppose they could use for any question. They just have to be careful. Do they need to give an example or do they need to expand? So if it's explained something like explaining the term consumer, they could give a key term, the definition there. But if it's explained the benefits of, then it moves more into or the impact of, then it moves into the SEE becomes state explain expand is what I've said to them. So if it's very basic, it's state explain example where at all possible. And that example sometimes needs to refer back to the question. So is it an Irish business? Is it the local economy? Um, and otherwise they should be using state explain expand. So try and give two pieces of information where they can. If it's a benefit and it kind of overlaps with um, outline. If it's a benefit or an impact, like highlight, is it a positive impact? What is the benefit and why is it a benefit? Don't just say like a new, um, an impact of an organization is creates employment. What's the in the benefit of that? Creates employment in the local area as a result of this or this will lead to, I, I've given them that kind of sentence starter to push them into the expand part. For the distinguish, I've always said to them, it's the difference between, they're fairly good with that try and give two definitions if they can and always clarify with the examples. Um, with describe, it's usually associated with explaining something or giving the advantages or disadvantages. So if it's advantages or disadvantages or explain, refer to the question, give an example that reflects the question. The outline seems to be the effects or the impacts. So again, state, explain, expand there. So I'm still using the C, but sometimes the, the extra E there is for expand rather than example. And I just say to them, like, if you can fit in an example, try and give an example anywhere that you can. The identify, I suppose, the main thing that I've seen from the marketing schemes is it's still a brief explanation. There's still a bit of an explain. It needs to be a full sentence. It's not a three worded answer. It's a full sentence. Classify is, is basic enough. It's just putting it into categories. So in this year's uh, exam papers, they were speaking about um discuss two costs and they wanted the category of fixed and variable. Now there wasn't specific marks going for them, but it's something that I didn't focus on when I was looking at um, expenses, I suppose enough. So I've tried to go back and do that now when we're revising. The illustrate part is explain with an example where possible um, a diagram or maybe a graph. So if it's a circular flow of income, it's come up before in um, sample papers. Um, and it's the easiest way to explain the circular flow of income is to, is to do the diagram and they, they've left a space for that. And then I, I keep focusing on that C method. Like I've spoken about other colleagues and we've kind of said all the questions seem to, you know, if they're finding it hard to remember exactly what they're supposed to do with each action or command verb, where at all possible, just keep using the C method. And that's what I've said to mine. Um, and then the mark breakdown what I've seen in some of the from the marketing scheme this year is it seems to be like all or nothing like things like um, the order of business documents well they're either getting the marks for them all being in the right place or they're not going to get anything because something's in the wrong place and that's I suppose very reflective of the leave insert business and, and I suppose the junior cert exam is, is kind of focusing that way where it's it's nearly that pushing them to get ready for that level so if it explain question is three marks, it might be three marks for the full answer, 100% correct, or they might get nothing. Like we know the way that the bell curve works some years, they might give one mark for a partial answer or they might not. So I suppose we have to be careful in, in focusing them for the exam. Well, I guess like, Try and read back over it if you've time because it's usually a decreasing mark like it would be in the leaving cert exam so like 411 for a six mark question or sometimes it's 222 so just to be careful and try and go back over it and make sure they're sure of the answers rather than taking a guess the other thing that i've spoken about and i suppose examiners would have said this years ago and it's it's kind of apparent now as well my kids say to me oh there's six lines there you know am i expected to fill the six lines and i said well as best you can you know, don't make your writing huge. Try and give two pieces of information and an example if you can. Use as much of the space that you've been given as possible. And within that, I'm constantly reminding mine that it, it's um, scanned now. So don't go outside the box. So for my revision test with my third years, I won't mark anything that's outside the boxes. And I try and give them boxes in their exam to get them used to how it will be for the real exam. So most of the common errors that I had seen um, I suppose in my own when I'm doing tests with them at the moment 
they're forgetting the euro sign in a question that's a calculation. Now, I suppose with the final accounts, when the euro sign is written in the column and it's underneath it that they're putting the answers, that's fine. But in their calculations, when they're physically putting down an answer, sometimes the answer box has a euro sign. But there was a question in the 2022 paper on supply and demand, and they were asking about equilibrium price and the equilibrium point. And they wanted the euro sign for the equilibrium price. And they actually wanted the unit beside um, the equilibrium quantity. So just to remind them that that's a silly one mark that they could lose there. The interpreting of graphs, um, when I was doing economic indicators with my third year, the two classes actually, it was a common error across the two classes. Um, they had, I suppose, learned high unemployment, low unemployment. But they, when they saw on a question, it was to do with a graph and there was a drop in unemployment. They mixed it up and they were saying, oh, there's a drop in employment. They weren't reading the answer carefully and they were seeing nearly what they wanted to see. So I was explaining to them, if there's less people unemployed, well, then more people are working. And they'd give me perfect answers if that had been the question, but they weren't reading the question properly. So the other thing with the supply and demand, and um, when I was arising that with mine and any graph really that I noticed with them, they're they're poor to label both axes. They might label one and not the other. They were poor to label the supply and demand with S and D on the actual curves themselves. And they were silly marks. If something's worth six or eight marks, they're silly marks for them to be thrown away. So it was actually my second year class that had said to me that their science teacher had said to them about salt. So when they're doing any graph, they needed to use salt, which was a correct scale, which some of mine weren't great on. Um, I was speaking to their maths teachers and they said it wasn't even across to another subject. They nearly forget what they've learned in another. So scaling their um, bar charts or whatever it is properly to show the correct amount of values, especially when it goes, when it's the national budget and they might have to show the different um, government expenditure. When it gets up into the millions, they're, they're very bad to scale on the graph. Uh, to label both axes, have all the labels. So if it's the supply and demand curves, label those as well. And to give a title. Um, now, I haven't seen that they've given marks for a title yet, but it could be something, again, that might be worth one mark in another paper. And there's no point throwing away that one mark. So I'm just going to look for a few minutes um, at the exam style answers that were given in the marking scheme. And I suppose what I highlighted as state explain example or what I'd seen a pattern in, in the, the different action or command verbs. So line came up um, a few times and I just have looked at um, question 18b, uh, the second part of it, and question 7. So um, outline one reason why interest, low interest rates encourage borrowing. So I was saying to them, when it's outline a reason, try and give the what, but the why as well. So they're giving back the state there when interest rates are low. So they're stating back nearly what the question is. I'm asking them, Individuals and a business will be more likely to borrow. That's the what is happening. And then why the why is there's lower repayments. They don't have to pay as much back on the loan. So I've said to them, when you're expanding, it's to get the what part, which is the explain, and the why, which is the expand. So the other question then was outline two advantages of PayPal. And this was one that was poorly answered. I suppose they'd They'd almost forgot what PayPath was because it was blended in with another style question. And some books might do this in the employment chapter. Another book might do it when they're looking at banking. So um, state explain, expand, I said to them there again because it's outlined. So the state part is it's convenient. The explain part, well, he can look online or he can go to the ATM and see his information. A lot of them have online banking now. And expand why is that an advantage to him because he doesn't physically have to go to the bank to lodge his wages or his earnings so I was just trying to show um my students as well where the marks were going and trying to when I've given them a question I get them to swap it with the person beside them and then I'll show them something like this and I'll say look you can't give them the three marks if they they don't have all three of these and I suppose if they they learn how to mark something. They can see where the marks are losing. And they're very good to say, well, he said this. Would you give him the mark? And I'd say, well, what would you give him? Oh, I'd only give him two. So they get good when they're looking at other people's questions, but not as, as great when they're reflecting on their own. Identify then was in question 18 and question four again. So in question four, it was identify two benefits um, of membership of the EU for Ireland. And these seemed to me more like explain answers. So I said to them again, state explain if they if they can expand do if they can give an example so 
the state part there in the example that I've highlighted is the creation of the single European market. What's to explain? Well, this leads to the free movement of goods and services. They could have given an expand part there if they had the room for it as well. So it's the what and the why is what I keep trying to, to push with them. In question four, it was talking about working from home, so remote working, um, and give two responsibilities to his employer for this. And that for them was hard because they were thrown, I suppose, by the, the, the work from home part. But again, it was just, they're referring back to the question in two responsibilities, giving the what and the why. So what must he do? Why it's stated in his, his contract of employment. Um, for this question here, they were very specific in the the answer that they gave. So they were asking to explain the term grant. And what I saw from this was they specifically gave the SEAI. Um, so what they were expecting it to come back in their answer was to refer back to the question in giving what is it, um, why might it be given or expand on it and who actually gives it. So I actually went back and I said to mine, we're, ever, we're revising um, definitions at the moment in key terms. So when we did grant, I said to them, you have to say what a grant is, what's the purpose or why is it used? So it doesn't have to be repaid, but it has to be used for its intended purpose. And then who is it given by? It might be given by the government or like in the question, the SEAI. Um, so trying to push them with their definitions as well when we're revising key terms to try and explain it in the SEE model again. For discuss questions, so a lot of the time it's discuss the roles or the impacts of something. So I again said to them, it's state, explain, example as best they can, or if it was a benefit, then state, explain, expand. So a social enterprise is, is the state part, um, an enterprise that tackles a social issue or raises awareness of social issue. And the example there was homelessness. So I'm just trying to push with mine. What's expected now at this stage in the year, in third year from exam answers, um, I'm trying to hopefully after Easter just push through exam papers and, and practice as much different questions as we can. The name question then was something else that came up. And one thing that was was said was you need to be sure of the answer. So sometimes with mine, um, I think one of the questions on a test I gave them recently from a government chapter was um, name the department that creates the national budget. And some of them gave me the Department of Finance slash the Re Office of the Revenue Commissioners. And I said to them, well, I can't mark because you're contradicting yourself with a wrong answer and you have the right answer there. So, you know, don't give two answers when it's a name. Give one answer. If you're not sure, go with whatever one you think it is. Don't give two because they mightn't give the marks if you're contradicting yourself with an incorrect answer, with a correct answer in the same line. And just, I suppose, what I'm trying to do with mine now at the moment um, with revision, we've got one chapter left um, to do. And then I'm trying to push them now to revise, I suppose, starting now before Easter um, so we can get through as much revision as we can. So yeah, I give them um, a topic or if two topics go together, like saving or borrowing. I've been giving it to them every week. We do an exam paper class and that's where I look over whatever revision that they've done. So I've asked them for proof of revision. Now, I don't expect them to write six pages of notes. I've said to them, if you do a Quizlet, and I usually find a link to a Quizlet, um, there's a website, Jason Ryan Business. He has all the, the different chapters laid out and Quizlets linked to them. And I say, do the Quizlet and send me the score that you've got on Google Classroom. Uh, at the moment, we're doing definition dots. So I've given them a list of 30 or 40 key terms. And we do five at the start of every class and we correct them. And the first class I gave them 10 to do and it was a revision class. So I gave them 10 definitions to do from the chapters we had just done. They had to go away and find the definitions themselves, try and practice them without the book, then look for them in the book um, and correct them themselves. And then I said to them, right in the next class, I'm going to test you on those 10 definitions. Because what a lot of parents said to me um, at the parent teacher meeting before Christmas was, oh, my son or daughter doesn't know how to revise. They find it really hard to revise. So I was trying to show them ways that they could revise. Um, I give them summaries of chapters. Now, it's not something really strenuous that I do. I might throw it up on a Google Doc at the end of class. If we finish a chapter that day, we'll go back over the chapter and I'll say, OK, what's the main important things that you need to focus on in this chapter? I type it out. They have um, a section at the back of their copy for me where they take down exam tips, I've called it. I started this just before Christmas with them. 
So they'll take down what they're expected, like a success criteria expected to know from that chapter. Or if we're doing a specific exam question and we're correcting it, like what I would have just gone through with you there, um, I'll highlight where the marks are going and they, they'll take down what to remember. Like there was a question on dirt before and the common mistakes that were made in the dirt calculation is they're very good to calculate dirt, but then they don't take this the dirt off the interest figure and then put the new interest figure onto their savings. So they've when we're going through the question revising calculations, I got them to take down that that was a common mistake. And I've said, when you're revising that chapter, flick back to your exam tip section in your copy and see what I might have said for that chapter. Uh, I'm trying to take an accounting topic every week or every two weeks. So it's something really small. I might take a short question like those extracts from the, the double entry and just get them to practice it. And if it's not an accounting chapter, I'll do really quickly the first five minutes, throw up maybe an interest calculation or on saving or borrowing or a small calculation that they do. And we correct it really quickly. And it's just a way of keeping them fresh on the other chapters that they tend to forget about as we're finishing the course and revising chapters. Um, when I review the formulas and calculations, what I've just kept saying to them is your workings are really important. Workings, workings, workings. Most um, exam papers have all the calculations for the junior cycle at the front of the, the exam paper. Um, for their mocks, I just gave them some extracts from different exam papers on all the different calculations. And I got them to take down all the definitions and, or sorry, all the, the formulas for them and then let them practice them. Um, linking chapters. So like when I'm doing the government chapters, there's a lot of chapters that link with government, the economic policy I just did with them there and government revenue and expenditure. And they forget that they link to previous topics like personal taxation. And I just true like when I'm doing a test with them now at the moment, I'll put in at the last page of the test, I'll put in one question from another exam that will link to that specific topic just so they're not forgetting that in the long questions, there will be a few different chapters in it and sometimes they can link together. I suppose exam question practice is the most important thing now and I'm trying to do one class a week and I, it's hard like I, they're missing classes at the moment with the school show and things but I choose a Friday if I have them on a Friday or one of the classes my last class with them in the week is a Thursday so we try to do one class a week where they have exam paper questions only I don't have my own classroom so they have to bring their books their workbooks their exam papers every class so they love when it's just one day a week that they have to bring the copies they have their exam tips and the exam papers um, and then I suppose I didn't see the relevance of it until I was looking at economic growth and we just looked at the sustainability goals and they, oh, we just did those in CSP or they showed me their geography mock where a lot of the one of the questions the long questions was on economic growth and then I noticed a lot of them were giving me great answers for the social and environmental impacts of economic growth and I said to them, we didn't do this specifically, this this style answer, where did you get it from? And they said, oh, we just did it in geography. So it's good when they can realise that their subjects are linking together and see that it's not overwhelming in the amount they have to learn for, for each subject. So that's it now. Um, I suppose if you have any questions, you can. That's great, Chloe. Thank you very much for that. I am just going to share my window so that I can bring back the Q&A. So that's great. Thanks very much. Um, so everyone, um, just if you want to post any questions, there's a bit more time left if you want to either do that via the Q&A section um, or the chat. So thanks for sending the, the questions that have come in to date. I'll start with the easiest and the shortest ones first. Um, so this one's for me. It's just someone asking when the book is available. So the book's available now um so if you need a sample as i mentioned earlier on you can um get in contact with your your local rep to, to organize that um chloe one here just asking about any useful apps for exam preparation i guess sort of digital resources or stuff that you might use yourself or with your students you mentioned um i think quizlet there but is there anything else that you might recommend um quizlet is great in the sense that there's three forms that they can use so they can use flashcards they can use um it's like a, a matching definition so they'll see the keyword and then a definition and they see how fast they can match them um and then the other thing that they can do is just a, a quiz so it's it's usually there if you literally look up on quizlet juniors or business and then whatever the the topic is 
Um, the other thing that I used, I found the definition dot thing on um, Twitter, and it was actually an English te- or an English school. One of the teachers there, a business teacher, had shared. Um, so if you look, literally look up on Twitter, definition dots, it's just a page where there's command words on it. So I use the side of the page to explain the command words. And then I would call out at the start of the class, OK, describe these five definitions or outline the benefits of these five definitions. And there's 30 something and you can just edit it. It's on Google Slides and you can just edit it to whatever keywords you want to do. So all mine were focused on um, the three economics chapters that I had most recently done. Um, and what they do is this purpose of it is supposed to be they highlight it in one color when they've written out the definition and then they when they are sure that they know it, they circle it again in a different highlighter color. Um, but then most of the key terms are similar between the English curriculum. I had taught myself in England um, and what they had was you could hover over the definition then. So when they had the correct what they thought was the correct definition, I could just hover over the definition and it gave them the, the key term then. Great. Thanks for that. Um, so a couple of people looking for copies of the presentation, which you, you'll get tomorrow. We'll, we'll do that on the results of the video, the video. Anyone who's registered for the event will get the, the video as well that they can link to. Um, Karen asks, could you explain the definition dots and the SEC exam answering technique for, for benefit slash impact? Um, with the definition dots, it's literally, it's like when I would have done my own leaving cert, I remember we did a key terms copy and I'd say I had 120 key terms by the time I finished my leaving cert. And every week we had to know at least 10 of them. And I'm kind of gone back to basics with them in their key terms or something they keep falling down on their exam answers. So I'm being really blunt with them. And I'm saying, if you don't know it, it's three marks or sorry, zero marks. If you know it, it's three marks. And I practice the, the SEE method with them when I do the definitions. So like I said, it's just at the moment we're doing five, five, five. So every morning they come in, I call out five definitions. They write them out in their copy. I throw up what the definitions are on the board or I just call them out myself. Um, they swap with the person beside them and they correct and they give each other what the marks are. And then they give each other um, a mark out of um, whatever it may be, 15, 20, well, it depends how many key terms we have. Um, and the SE, when it comes to impacts or benefits, what I've been saying to mine is state, explain, expand. So state what the impact is, explain it. So is it a positive or negative? Um, and the expand is either who does it impact or um, what is the benefit? So why is it a benefit to someone? So if it's the creation of employment, let's say, I'll get them to write down, create employment. Um, this creates employment in the local area or this creates direct employment in the local area. As a result of this, there is more disposable income that can be spent in local businesses. Or as a result of this, there is a multiplier um, or a spin-off effects with other local businesses. OK, thanks, Chloe. Um, another question from Dee Whelan asking, how long would you spend covering the f uh, covering a final account? Uh, that topic probably takes me the longest. We usually do it as the last topic in second year. Um, so I would usually spend four weeks at least. It depends what the class is like and then go back over it again in third year before Christmas. So we would have done, um, I suppose, the first week getting used to what's an asset, what's liability. Um, then I do the trading account. Then I bring in the profit and loss section. Then I do the income statement in full. Then I do the statement of financial position. I'll do up to total net assets. Then I'll do the bottom finance buy section. Then I'll do it all together for a week, a week and a half. Thank you. I hope that answers it. Um, Ellen asks, Chloe, thank you for the feedback on the exam paper. Any advice on the assessment task component, please? Um. It's hard. The assessment task for the, the CBA, what the students find hardest, and I found with mine as well, the uh, second year, the one they do in second year, the language in it they find hard. Even when you when you say to them, so I'll give them like a copy of it or I, I'll give them a copy of the questions and I'll say this is what this question means. But they still they still find it hard. So what I've gotten them to do is I've given like a simplified version of the reflections for the CBAs and a simplified version of the assessment task. 
but I don't do it based specifically on the CBA. I might give them to them on a piece of homework or something and get them to practice it. Um, and then speak to them before they do the assessment task and say, look, we've done practice ones of this. It's very similar to the questions that you've answered before. I suppose practice is the most important thing to try and fill it into their heads that I know it's been asked in this specific way, but you've already answered questions like this before. Okay. So it's is it like just the language of reflection that you're using in the assessment task is is different to typically what students might be used to for business studies? Yeah, I suppose. And like as much and all as they we ask them questions and they do reflect, they're not great at it. And in our we're trying, um, I think across the whole school at the moment in my school where all of the departments are putting um, a reflection at the start of the tests. So we'll write down there's a um, a before and an after test reflection. So before the test, they have to write down one piece of feedback from a previous test that they're going to try and implement in this test, um, what they think they'll get in the test, what grade or what percentage or whatever. And then we ask them one or two reflection questions at the end of the test. And that's, it's an easier way of getting them to give themselves a bit of feedback rather than sometimes I find I was doing a feedback section at the start of every test and I was writing three or four points for every child and they were looking at the grade and then yeah happy with that I'll get that signed tonight and they weren't really looking at what feedback I gave them whereas if you spend maybe 10 minutes at the start of a test asking them one or two reflection questions on the test it, it gets some habit of reflecting. And uh, I just I would want to ask just from what you've seen of I suppose there, there there've only been a limited number of papers, but are you seeing any trends as such or patterns in the paper, or is is there a lot of difference across the board? That, you know, is it very mixed? I don't know from the view. Or not? No, I would say it's very mixed. It's just they need to understand that the long questions are a blend of a question, like the. Question 17 could be, A could be all about insurance, and then they'll use the same person, but they'll ask another question all about the consumer. And there might be one question that might link them together. Um, and sometimes they find that hard when it's not specifically themed like it might be in, in other subjects. So I suppose getting them used to the fact that they need to link strands and chapters together. So when I give them revision, I try and give them revision of chapters I know link together. Um, kind of give them the success criteria of how they might they might overlap the what they need to look at when they're looking at the two chapters or three chapters together yeah plus the fact there's no option as such no choices you just have to take yeah. every question as well right yeah. you have to answer every question yeah the only other thing that jumped out at me was the fact that identify wasn't a basic answer it still needed a full sentence explanation that was the only thing that really jumped out at me this year okay great well we're coming just past 7.45 or nearly we're coming on to, to 7.50 and I think that's pretty much all the questions. Sorry uh, if anyone noticed my cursor floating around there. I was just trying to toggle between the chat and the Q&A sections because we've got a flurry of activity there towards the end. But um, so Chloe, thanks very much for that. Um, I'm sure it was very informative for everybody who um, was attending the webinar. As I mentioned earlier, you'll have a recording sent out to you um, tomorrow and um, also you'll see the presentation there. I think we've responded to some queries for people looking for attendance certificates, so we we we, we kind of um, help with that or we provide sort of a confirmation of your attendance, which I hopefully that you know that you can use. Um, but other than that, um, I'd just like to thank everybody again for joining us this evening. I hope you found the last 45 minutes or so beneficial and insightful. I know I found it really interesting. And um, thanks again and have a, have a lovely evening.